following interview was conducted with um, Joe Rudolph for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Friday, August 15, 2008 at Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the oral history librarian. Welcome. Thank Tell you. Tell us a little bit about where you were born and your early years and family. Well, I grew up in Crown Point, Indiana, and uh, I probably came to Purdue because my father was a Purdue alumnus, and he ran the telephone company in Crown Point, and uh, I don't even remember. We didn't have a whole lot of conversation about where I'd go to school because he used to bring me and a number of my young friends to football games when we were in grade school and high school. So Purdue was always kind of where we were going to go. So I came, when I graduated from high school in 1940, I didn't go to school right away. I worked for a year and a half for the Illinois Bell Telephone Company and I came to Purdue as a freshman in 1941. And I'd been a football manager in high school for four years and so I went out for a manager's job at Purdue and I was one of 16 freshmen and got to be one of eight sophomores and then uh, in 43 uh, we were all in the enlisted reserve car and we were called and we went into the service and I was gone for three years. Mm -hmm. Tell us where, where did you serve? Were you in the... I was... I had a, a very interesting... I left a field artillery at Purdue, started in a coast artillery in Fort Eustis, Virginia. We, about 40 Purdue boys that were there, we all applied for the Air Force because we didn't like the coast artillery. Most of us made it and were sent to Buffalo, New York, where we started our cadet training in the Air Force. So we had six months of college at the University of Buffalo and uh, lived in the Union Building. And we were getting ready to, to graduate and to go on to, to pre-flight when we got the telegram from Hap Arnold saying, uh, we have enough people in pilot, navigator, and bombardier training so what they're really saying is the Battle of the Bulge just started and we need a lot of healthy young people. And the ASTP boys and the Air Cadet people were all called. And the next thing we knew, we were at Camp Pickett, Virginia, training with an infantry outfit. So I went overseas with the 78th Division. And this would have been 1944? Yeah, and, and uh, I was, was went through the Battle of the Bulge, and then a uh, colonel in the 16th Corps, who was from my hometown, found me and said, I'm going to get you transferred to my outfit. So I went as his liaison man, and I was with the 16th Corps. We put troops across the Roar and Orion River, and when the war was over, I stayed with him, and he went around Germany looking. He had been with the Union Pacific Railroad, so he went around Germany looking for uh, locomotives, railroad, that were usable and could be salvaged. And then when he had enough points, he went home, and I was assigned to another person, another colonel, and I stayed with him till he went home, and then I had enough points, and I was fortunate to be transferred to the 101st Airborne Division, and uh, they were picked to put on the Victory Day Parade in New York, so we came home into Queen Mary in four days, <laughs> and uh, got to have, have a few days in New York. Fortunately, I got out of, out of the service in January, came right down to Purdue and was able to get in in February, start the February semester. And being a member of a fraternity, I had a place to live, which was really crucial in 1946. 
So housing was tight. Uh, oh yeah, they were living in out at the airport. And they were living in in, uh, in the field house. You know, you just got out of the service, sleeping in a double deck bunk with a footlocker, and you're right back with a double deck bunk and a footlocker in a Purdue field house, <laughs> or over in the old Duncan Electric building. They were every place because uh, it just the the enrollment just mushroomed. Right. So I was fortunate enough to. Uh, I went back as being a junior manager on the football team. Became uh, Joe Stivers and I became the two senior managers. And in those days, the senior managers had a lot of responsibility. We traveled by train, and you carried the money and paid the the on the in the dining cars. You tipped the porters and you made all the arrangements. And you got to know people like Frank Ackerman and Red Mackey and Pop Doan and those type of people. So when I graduated, what, in, what year did you graduate? In February of '48. I said to Red Mackey, "If anything ever opens that you think I might be qualified for at Purdue, would you let me know?" And then I thought to myself later. How many young fellows say that to Red? But by golly, I left and went to Champaign, Illinois with the Bell Telephone Company. And uh, in uh, the f late fall of 48, I got a f phone call one night from Red, and uh, he said the Alumni Association was going to hire a field secretary. and. Uh, Whoever they hired would work half for the Alumni Association, half for him for a while. And uh, would I be interested? And I certainly was interested, and I checked it out, decided if I was, I was single, if I was ever going to make a change, this was the time to do it. I came back to Purdue and started April 1, 1949. And for the first couple of years, I worked half and half and half. What was the field secretary? Did that was that trips? Yeah. And what did you one, do in the athletics? And visiting Purdue clubs is mainly what the field secretary did for the alumni association. What I did for the athletic department, I made all the travel arrangements for football and basketball. I went all over the country, picking up uh, recruits and uh, just anything they needed. And that's how I got a close tie with the athletic department, which I kept through all of my 40 years of working for the Alumni Association, which was very helpful. And I made a lot of their arrangements. I made the arrangements for their first time that the team ever flew because we had a Purdue graduate, Ken Jordan, who was with Capital Airlines, and he t asked me if we wouldn't like to try putting the team on a DC-4, I think it was, or so. And so Red said, yeah, we'll give it a try. And that's when we went from there. But it uh, through the years it paid off, and then later my association with the John Purdue Club. Sure. Then the next step, how did you become the head of the director of the association, the alumni association? Tell us a little bit about that. Well, in 1953, the board of directors uh, decided we ought, ought to expand a little bit. So they made named me the director of the association. And Ethball, who had been there for a number of years, was named Director of Public Relations. And uh, so I took over, actually, the management of the association, in which we had the Alumnus Magazine. And in those days, 
We had the only record department for the whole university. We had like a postcard size card, you've probably seen them, that we'd send out to people and they'd fill it out with all the information about themselves and their class and their where they lived on the campus and what their job was and how many children they had and their wife's name. And we had those in big file cabinets. And that was, the, that was really the master file for the university. And uh, so we had the, the record department with a supervisor and four girls, and then we had a membership a clerk, and uh, that was the record department. Then I had a, a full-time bookkeeper, and we had uh, the editor of the alumnus magazine. And uh, this is where all- were you, Where were you located? Where was the alumni office located at that time? In the union building. Okay right across from the uh, what is it, the southwest corner where the where you bought newspapers and candy and uh, we were just catty corner from them and we were there uh, until they built the Dalk Alumni Center it was remodeled after I retired and it was changed quite a bit the interior of it, but that's where the the and it was very handy because Gala Week, homecoming, football weekends, uh, people gravitated to the alumni office. If they had a question, they wanted wanted to change their dress, they wanted to buy something, wanted anything. We were there to be of service to them, and it was a wonderful place to be. Sure. And because uh, they stayed in the union, most of them, when they came back in those days. Right. And uh, well, and then we kind of, then I hired uh, Jack Carl and eventually Nikki Horner. Your staff increased then? Yes, okay. after, eventually. Jack was the first one that came, so we had more, we could visit more clubs and organize more clubs. Sure, right. And uh, then eventually hired Mary Ruth Snyder, who was terrific. And uh, wasn't she involved? You had a, used to have a Women's Day or something. The alumni would sponsor. Yes. Uh huh. And she was sort of handled some of that. And then I hired Nikki Horner. And Nikki did an excellent job. So. In those days, it was much a smaller operation than it is today. And uh, the Purdue Alumni Scholarship Foundation, which became the Purdue Alumni Foundation, uh, eventually, it used to, when it was first started, it had a director called Herb, his name was Herb Duggins, and then Roscoe Siebold, and Cordy Hall, and then Ed Carpick, and then Dick Thornton. And when Thornton was moved to the Mackey Arena to open up a John Purdue office, why uh, the Purdue Alumni Foundation, as director of the Alumni Association, I was also director of the Purdue Alumni Foundation. And uh, I, I'm not sure how it is today, but in those days, and we had a, a like a board of directors for the foundation, and they met several times a year. Yeah. And uh, but uh, Agnes Bowman, she was with our foundation from almost the beginning. She was a wonderful lady, and she trained all these people that I named, and uh, she kind of ran it. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little about the John Purdue Club as you were involved in that. Well, uh, the John Purdue Club uh, started when, uh, let me back up a little bit and say that uh, about the end, near the end of President Elliott's term, uh, there were some Purdue alumni that wanted to start a foundation so they could raise money for scholarships. 
Verl Campbell, class of 17, Walter Krull, W. Henry Roberts, class of 12. <coughs> they went to see Dr. Elliot on several occasions, finally convinced him that we needed a foundation. And so he said, okay, you go ahead and start one. And uh, I, I don't know just exactly how it all was put together, but they did start and they hired Herb Duggins as their first director. Herb was a class of 35 and uh, he was the first director. Well, it grew and grew and uh, Roscoe Siebel, who had, I, was the chief financial officer of Westinghouse, retired and came here and ran our foundation and then he turned it over to Cordy Hall. And Cordy uh, was running the foundation when we decided that we needed to raise some money for athletics. So they talked to George Schilling, who was the legal counsel for the university from the Brandigan Law Firm. And the Big Ten had said in late 50s, 1957, if any Big Ten school has a legal foundation on their campus that can accept gifts and give a tax deduction, then you can use that to raise money for what they called athletic grant and aid. So, Red Mackey, Cordy Hall and myself went over to George Schilling's office on February 18th, 1958, and George had studied what the Big Ten had authorized, <coughs> what our foundation was, and he said, gentlemen, everything is looks fine. You have a foundation. You can... legally accept contributions and, and give a tax deduction. So I'd say, you could, you want to put a booster club together? Go ahead. Uh, what are you going to call it? And being the low man of the totem pole, I didn't say anything. But Cordy Hall said, why don't we call it the John Purdue Club? And Red said, that sounds good. From that point on, we had the John Purdue Club. They really started to publicize it and everything in, in early 59. But I kept the records in a, on three by five cards in a little metal box until the box got full, and then I kept it in my desk drawer till the drawer got full and that's when Dick Thornton left the Purdue Alumni Foundation, moved into Mackey Arena, hired a secretary, and opened up an office for the John Purdue Club. And we moved all the records over there. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we started out with about 50 people, and today they have over 9,000 members of the John Purdue Club and a staff of maybe 14 with a suite of offices up in the new press box. So... It's really growing. Tell us, um, I'm going to ask you about the alumni representatives to the Board of Trustees, how those come about for the researchers. And I how can't, many, is I there can't, three? Or yes, three? I can't tell you the history of it because it was something that, I, that we inherited. In other words, when I came to work for the Alumni Association, I was I learned that three, three of the trustees were selected by the Alumni Association, and then they had to be approved by the governor. Uh, I also learned that through the years, FBA and had selected people that were so outstanding when you put their name on the ballot, 
nobody else was going to contest their people like Bill Handley and J. Ralph Thompson, uh, who and Maury Canoy. But uh, so each year we would s- select. Usually, after we picked somebody, we would s- would select the same person f- for a number of terms, not just a three year term. The term was for three years. The term was for three years, right. and we o- and we we keep the person for three years, and then for three more, and we put their name on the ballot, but there wasn't any any contest. There was an election for the reappointment for three years. Yes. And after the election, the governor still approves it? Yes. It was one, I said. And I'm yeah. asking these for the researchers so they understand. Just because you won the election, it still has to be approved by the governor? Yes. Okay, okay. And uh, the other thing was, uh, you know, uh, I'd always, well, it was my responsibility, I'd always visit with the president of the university and see that they were pleased with everything, and I thought that was just a, a courtesy. That, right. So, uh, but through the years, and even to today, uh, we have such, Mike Burke, uh, uh, Tom Spurge, we have such outstanding people that, you know, it's hard to... Done very well. One thing I want to ask you, changing something, but Autumn Tuesdays was a program that you started when you were... Yes. Uh, we did it... Uh, Just tell the researchers, was it speakers or what the program was? Well, the program, we'd have d- different people from the university. We'd have the, uh, the uh, director of admissions, or we'd have... The, the One of the coaches. Basketball coach, or we'd have... Uh, Vice President uh, of, or the Dean of Agriculture, and they were all very willing to participate. Sure. And we had three breakfasts a year, uh, and we'd have it at we had it at the MCL cafeteria. Mm-hmm. And uh, the the years I started, and all the years that we I ran it till I retired, it was always very popular. We'd fill that that one room that they have for special occasions and uh, but I'm not sure I think that uh, this last year I don't believe okay. they had it uh, after you um, or some other uh, little talk, talk a little bit about outreach about some of the pro- gala week and homecoming you people sort of coordinate that uh, my office does do they? Homecoming, uh, we did at Purdue through Ethbaugh's tenure and through my tenure. We did something that when I went to Big Ten alumni meetings with my fellow directors and said, and the first time I told them we had a homecoming banquet after the football game, they all looked at me and said, you what? <laughs> because if you don't win, sometimes, you know, it's not that happy an occasion. But the homecoming banquet was started because they, some of you long before me, felt that there were people that lived in a lot of the residence halls or a rooming house when they came back for homecoming, they had no place to go. If you were in a fraternity or sorority, you could go by your your residence and see people and have a snack and that sort of thing. If you lived in a rooming house, you really had no place to go. Right. So here was an opportunity to hear the president of the university, to hear the glee club, and to have a nice meal. And so... This for years and years and years. That was, you know, that was the the, home, event. the main event for homecoming, and uh, now since I retired, uh, 
I think Larry Prio changed that whole format, but uh, that was the reason that we did that. And it was very successful. We filled both ballrooms most times, and uh, even if we didn't win the game, by the time the president spoke and the glee club sang and every, you know, okay. it, it was okay. Right. And, uh, but Gala Week was a different is a different thing. That's something where you work with the officers of the classes. And in those days, the classes weren't the size they are now. So people knew one another. And it was amazing the number of people in those older classes that would come back. And, uh, you know, we had... Uh, on Friday night, each class has have, would have their own dinner and do their make of their own awards and do everything they wanted to do. Right, yeah. And then we had a class parade on Saturday morning. And then <clears throat> we had a lunch on Saturday noon, which was the annual meeting of the Purdue Alumni Association. As a corporation, you had to have an annual meeting. And then uh, there were a lot of things we had planned for them in the afternoon, and then we had the Gale Week banquet on Saturday night, which was was a huge banquet and, and well attended. And uh, there again, President of the University, uh, the Glee Club, and uh, <clears throat> when I first started. Miss Nugent was in charge of the food service, and, and this lady was a dear soul, but she was not too flexible. And I'd say, Miss Nugent, can't we serve them? No, we're going to have a buffet line, and we had buffet lines for for a number of years, and here in those days. People that came back for their fiftieth, they weren't as they weren't playing golf and tennis like people are today that come back for their fiftieth. And here they're trying to go through a buffet line and get back to the table. So finally, when she retired, we got to have round tables with with service, <laughs> and that was really. A, a breakthrough, a real breakthrough. And then on s Sunday morning, they all, all the classes had a breakfast, and the president would go around and s s stick his head in and say hello to each, and usually his wife would be with him, yeah. and say hello to each class. And uh, then Sunday noon, we had the loyalty luncheon, and that's where we presented the twenty fifth and the fiftieth. A nice certificate that you could frame, right. and uh, that was usually just attended by those people that were going to get a certificate. Sure, right. But it was a it was a nice occasion. Right. Talking about class gifts, tell me for the research about the bell tower, which was your class. Uh, each class wants to do something for the university, and we had a committee of about <clears throat> I don't know we had be. Carpick and, and uh, Corky Mitchell, John Botha was our class president, Byron Anderson, myself. Uh, there's, I don't know, Dick Camp, there were about six or eight of us, had a committee to decide, well, what are we going to do for the university? And out of this committee came the suggestion that we build a bell tower. Well, that was quite an undertaking. And uh, so we got permission, and, and they said, okay. And they assigned one of the young ladies from the development office to take it on as her project. And Byron Anderson and myself were the co-chairman of the fundraising committee. And uh, we did a lot of work for a year, and we didn't come up with quite enough money to do the job. But fortunately, Dr. Beering 
really thought a bell tower would, would be a nice thing to have on the campus. And he said, I'll find the additional funds, which he did. So we call it the class of 1948 university bell tower, given both credit for it. And it was built by the Kettle Hut Construction Company, and at that time, was the Kettle Hut was owned by Ed Olson, who was a class of 51. <coughs> and Ed told us that it really required <coughs> a, a lot of special work. It was quite a feat to build the thing. But <coughs> for, fortunately, Every piece of literature that's come out since it's been built has a bell tower in the background. Including on the masthead of the exponent. Yeah. Uh, let me ask you this, were the, were you, was the class involved with the site location or oh, the I, university made the... I think, <clears throat> I really can't no. remember that. I think we probably were discussed the thing, but uh, worked out to be a perfect spot, it is. and you can see it from every place. Right. It's a real landmark. Very right. Yes, right. Okay. Um, I was going to ask. Uh, you got some awards. Uh, I'd like to ask about the Joe and Gail Rudolph Scholarship and Fellowship. For well, when I retired, uh, they started that okay. for me, uh, and, and Gail's and my name. And every year we get a report of who, who gets assistance from that. Right. And uh, it was when I retired, they did uh, several nice things. They uh, they let me keep the, the association car that we had. They started a scholarship in our name and I don't know where they got the tickets but they sent Gail and I to the Masters in Augusta which was really uh, special special yeah. so and uh, we they had the retirement party uh, the Gail Week banquet was Saturday night and we had dinner and then, as always and then we went over to to the Loeb Playhouse and uh, everybody went into the theater part and then we had we were all up on the stage and, and had Bob Ferguson was the president of the association at that time and he was kind of the master of ceremonies but uh, it was a nice evening. Right. Let's talk a little bit about family. Uh, the wife, did you meet your wife here? Yes. Gail, I grew up in Crown Point. Gail grew up in Hammond. Our parents knew one another, but we had never, because she's seven years younger than I am. But I was working here, and uh, I, I, one Sunday in St. Boniface, I saw this young lady, and, and uh, she was with some of her sorority sisters, one of them who I knew, and so I asked Carol O'Brien uh, who this young lady was, and he, she said, would you like to meet her? And I said, yes. <laughs> so that's how I met Gail. But it was an interesting thing. The Theta House on Littleton Street years ago, I, you remember where it was? Right across the street on the corner of Columbia and Littleton, it's still there, an old three-story house. Well, Hank Stram and I were both single. He was coaching, and I was working with the Alumni Association. We had that first-floor apartment in that old house. And the Thetas found out that every morning when we drove the campus, we had two cars that it's nice to come out about the time we're leaving to get a ride to the campus. But Gail was in that group, and so I got to meet her, and uh, 
dated and eventually uh, we married I think 57 years ago yeah. and you had children and they yes we have three children Janet's the oldest she's the class of 73 I think RJ is the next he's the class of 75 and John is the class of 78 and my dad was a class of 14, and Gail's a class of 51. And I was should have been 45, but I was 48. But uh, you got your she, own alumni chapter there. <laughs> yeah, but she was a she was a real help uh, because years ago, when the board it wasn't near the alumni board wasn't near as big as it is today, we did a lot of entertaining in our house on the co that one in Chippewa and Pawnee and uh, she she did a lot of that in fact she got a sagamore of the Wabash when I retired I I had received one and she got one which was which that's was very nice. nice very special very nice yeah. but uh, do you have a favorite Purdue tradition that comes to mind? Or an outstanding event? I often ask people that. They would share something with us. <laughs> Sometimes it's hard. You have quite a few. No. I, you kind of caught let me. me. Um, let me ask you this then. Uh, in closing and some some remarks that might be appropriate what you'd like to close off with comes to mind well there were some things I was that I was I think I you and I visited before but there were some things that I was pleased that I was part of when I'm uh, when we went to the Rose Bowl along with all my other duties and having the, in 1967 this was, why Gail and I were asked to host the astronauts and I can't remember how many we had but Grissom and Jaffe were there and uh, was taking them to the parade and then to a luncheon and then to the game and uh, that was and then after the game, we had all the group back up to our suite. And, and then it was just a short time later, the Grissom and Chaffee were killed. And I was asked, I was represented at Purdue University at their funeral in uh, Washington, D.C., which I was pleased and happy to do. And Gail and I were invited to attend the launch when Armstrong went to the moon. And uh, on Friday, on the night before the launch, they had a wonderful cocktail dinner party. And all of the network people that you'd ever heard of were there. And uh, we were, we got to sit at the table with Neil's family. And then we saw the launch. And then when Saren went to the moon, uh, Art and Nancy Hansen, and Gail and I went for that launch. And uh, Saren and Hansen and I happened to be fraternity brothers. So that's that was nice. I had the pleasure of starting the Molenkoff Golf Classic, which has been very successful. We started in 1976 on Marco Island. And we started it there because Coach Mullenkoff, when he retired, he rented, a, he rented a place on Marco in the winter. And uh, he had a lot and was thinking of building there, but then he passed away. So we started it there, and then we moved it into Naples. And it's been there ever since, but it's been very successful. And, for the last 
I don't know how many years. I ran it for the first 13 years, and then I turned it over to Dick Walbaum and Larry Priel. But uh, Ed Elliott helped me, and Nate Paulus, and some of those people, just on a voluntary basis. And uh, we always had a, a full capacity, 144 golfers, and and uh, maybe 350, 400 for dinner in the evening. And uh, as I say, they've changed the format a little bit this last year, but it's still a part of that. The President Council has a whole weekend built around it where they have uh, a number of things uh, back to the campus where they bring people down to conduct classes, have a dinner, and, mm -hmm. and uh, but Monday is still the golf, and uh, which I'm happy that they're continuing. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the Alumni Association has put out, uh, the first directory they put out was in 1934. In 1961, a gentleman by the name of Cecil Cooley, M class of 21, from Denver, Colorado, was on my board of directors. And he decided that he wanted an alumni directory. And Mr. Cooley was a very convincing person. And this was really kind of funny because it was, the board couldn't make up their mind whether who wanted it. It was quite an undertaking oh, in those yeah. days. Oh, yeah. Not with computers, but in those days. Finally, they said, okay. He said, if, you know, if there's any financial problem, anything, I'll, I'll help you out. So we went ahead and put out a directory in 1961 of all the alumni. And since then, they've done one in 69, 86, 92, 97, and they just put one out in 2008. And, uh, which is very complete and uh, which is uh, nice. So uh, those are some of the things that, that uh, should I mention? The, another thing that <coughs> might be interesting is the fact that uh, in 1954, Gail and I went to the National Convention of Alumni Directors in Biloxi, Mississippi. And when it was, when the convention was over, I had learned that one of the first people to go to Purdue lived in Mississippi, and his name was Fremont Goodwine. And we found out where he lived, and Gail and I went to visit him. And he lived in a small house back on some property and I, I, it's out of a small town which I unfortunately can't tell you the name of but I have a picture of he and his wife Fremont grew up in Indiana he told me that he was a member of the first class at Purdue University that he sat at John Purdue's desk and filled out his application for Purdue and later, after graduating and going on, and he became Lieutenant Governor of Indiana and was a pallbearer at John Perdue's funeral. So we have, I have this picture of him. He wrote me a letter after we visited him, and unfortunately I can't find the letter, but uh, it, uh, it was quite an experience to be able to see a person that was a member of the first class at this university. So. Is that, that most of your things covered? Anything else? Anything further or you can think of? <clears throat> Just, we were. One for, he's going to make a comment. Go ahead. The Olympics going on right now brings us to uh, Bob Kriebel's column 
in last uh, Sunday's paper where he talked about Ray Yuri in the, who in the 1908 Olympics uh, Ray Yuri graduated from Purdue University he grew up in Tippecanoe County and in fact he lived on North 5th Street in Lafayette and he had polio as a seven year old youngster and they say he never walk again and ten years later he he enrolled at Purdue and was on the track team. And he went on, I think, to win a total of 10 gold medals in uh, track and field. And uh, I had learned about this man, and uh, I'm on the committee for the Athletic Department Hall of Fame. And so I brought up his name and uh, they researched it and said yes by all means and so he was taken in and his his grandson came to represent him that particular night which i was happy that that we did so i think I think we've covered, I, I want to thank you very much for your time. I think this was a very good interview and I'm sure our researchers will benefit. Thank you very much.